بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله we have done three or two of the major قواعد out of the five today we are going to do number three and then إن شاء الله next week the last two are very easy to go over so we'll do two of them next week so just like this week we'll try to finish in between thirty to forty five minutes. The qa'idah that we are going to be speaking about before we continue. Do they hear us? Yes, they do. Inside they do. But I think, yeah. I think they prepared for it because they, they know. They are reading. I think they're trying to get the office of Allah. Oh, well, maybe they're going to. I don't want to bother them. They're fine. No, you could tell. Let them figure it out, huh? They have. Okay, alhamdulillah. So the. Um, the qa'idah that we are going to be focusing on today it is al-mashaqqatu tajrib al-taysir that whenever there is hardship the sharia opens up and brings ease the sharia is going to bring ease and like we always do we begin with where do you get the proof from the Quran and the Sunnah to be able to say something like this with the first one when we said that umur bin al-qasidiha we said the proof for it is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna wa ta'amal dunia and for every single one we have been given the proof for this one you have a few ayats in the Quran that tell you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately wants ease for the servants for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says yuridu allahu bikum al yusra wa la yuridu bikum al asra that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for you and he does not want hardship so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease. Another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ There hasn't been put in the religion any harm or any barrier to you being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then another verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make it easy for you. So this is from the verses in the Quran that tell you about this qa'idah. Of if there's hardship because of the Sharia, the Sharia actually opens up and brings ease. From the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, there's a hadith in the Sahih of Bukhari and the Sahih of Muslim, where the Prophet ﷺ, he says, "Inna muyassirin," that you have been sent, you have been sent, meaning the Ummah of Muhammad ﷺ, as muyassirin, people that make things easy. We were sent here to make it easy for people. وَلَمْ تَبْعُثُوا مُعَسَّرِينَ And we were not sent, we were not sent as a people to, make, to bring difficulties. So this is one hadith that comes also. You have a hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha in the same of Bukhari and the same of Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi she describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and she says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was never given a choice between two things. Except he always chose the easier one as long as there was no sin in choosing that easier option. And there's many that we are going to be uh, going through where whenever the Sharia commands you to do something, because of a hardship that is there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for you, makes it easy for you to still fulfill the Sharia, to still fulfill the command in one way or another. In this qaida, we don't want to loosely take it to mean every single type of hardship makes that means I can, I can make it easy on myself to do certain things but the way that we should look at it is they have put a number to what type of mashaqqa makes the sharia become easy and they have said uh, So the seven things that whenever you hear al mashaqqa to tajdib al taysir you are looking for seven reasons that are considered the mashaqqa. So the first one, and as we go along it should become more clear, the first one is as safa Any travel, that there is some ease that is going to come through. Wal-marad, any sickness, through it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated ease. When ikrahu, someone being forced to do something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated ease. 
والنسيان forgetfulness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made ease available والجهل and then any a type of ignorance that is going to allow you to be forgiven for some of the actions that a person would do because of their ignorance ignorance here is looked at as a hardship in general ignorance being ignorant it is a hardship that a person is in and it is something that a person to, should try to get out of by learning right? and then the last one it is any type of hardship in general or any type of calamity that comes or any type of deficiencies that come through them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated ease so let's go and look at the first one what did we say the first one was? first type of mashaqqa? traveling, traveling. what does safar make easy for us? salah so this is, this is the first one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says وَإِذَا ضُرِبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَنْ تَقْصُرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ that when you are traveling, it, it's no blame on you if you were to go and take the salah and make it short. And these are the salahs that are Bubaiya, the four raka'ah prayers of Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. You take them and you turn them into two raka'ahs when you're traveling. So this is one of them. Another rukhsa that comes because a person is traveling is what? Al jam. Bain salatain. Allah being able to combine salahs, two of them at a time, whether it is at the beginning or the later one. For example, we could combine Dhuhr and Asr. This means that we could combine it at two times, at the time of Dhuhr and at the time of Asr. We go to Maghrib and Isha, we could combine it at the time of Maghrib and at the time of Isha. What is another one that a person could have a rukhsa for? Because of travel. So yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ That whoever of you is either sick, and this will bring back again time of sickness, and whoever of you is عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ You are allowed to actually go and make this fast up another time. Before I get to your question, here, what fasting is being talked about? From Allah. The other ones you, you don't need fast You don't need to fast the other ones. Right? That one you don't need an excuse and you don't have to go and make it up. So Ramadan, this is from the arkan of Islam, that is you're allowed to take it outside of its prescribed time because of travel. Now the question is Shaykhi, uh, what's the length of the period of uh, when you do the salat if you are traveling? Is it the time you're traveling is abroad? But it's away from your home, so is there any time limit? Because this is yeah. a really quick, big question, and so I'm being hit with this. Okay, thank you. So I, I can give you two answers. Good. I can give you the answer of the Shafi'i Madhab, mm -hmm. and I can give you the answer that would make it the closest one to the Sunnah. Okay. The one that the Shafi'i Madhab has is a span of uh, four days not including the days of travel so that means let's say you and i decide to leave today well, let's say we leave tomorrow morning before the time mm -hmm. we are going to go to indonesia for some reason mm -hmm. it takes us 14 hours to travel if we leave around eight o'clock in the morning let's say we get there at eight o'clock this day of travel we can combine in short prayers once we get there we have these, these four days. Let's say we're only there for four days and on the fifth day we are going to come back. On that fifth day, we are traveling back and we can count, we don't count those the, the days of travel, but the days of actually being in the place we travel for. So that is the method. For a total of about six days that a person could be shortening and combining prayers. After that, it would end. There's some of that that keep it at three, and there are some that take it all the way to 14. And the closest to the Sunnah is that as long as you are a traveler, as long as you are a traveler, meaning we left to go to Indonesia, we're going to be there for two weeks, we're going to be there for three weeks, we can shorten and combine our prayers if we believe that there's actual hardship. 
that in you and I, like it's better for us to combine our prayers. Where this becomes, some of our family members and some of the people in the community, they go back home for three weeks, they go back home for four weeks, they go back home for a month and a half. The advice that I would give them is, if let's say on one of those days, you are planning to go and do something, you are planning to go and travel to meet family that live far away, they live in the village, wherever you know, the case might be, and you're going to be on the road. There, go ahead and combine your prayers, go ahead and shorten them. But when it comes to, I'm in this Muslim country, and I'm going to go to the masjid and pray, then they'll really, like, the, the, the excuse of this is going to make it easy for me is not actually there anymore. Because you're going to be in the masjid regardless. Right, so if you're already in the masjid regardless, just go ahead and pray with them. But the time could be as long as you consider yourself to travel. Right, so that, 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 that would be the time. Personally, me, I, I, I sleep to the six days and I just leave it there. So six days, that is including the days of travel, which are going to be one, one day. And when we say one day, one day, we mean a 24-hour time span. And then four days that we're there. After this class, we're just going to pray. Um, he's going to pray regular prayer. Yeah. Now, so these are, the other thing that um, Rukhsa comes is when we make wudu and we're traveling, what can we do for three days? Masah. Masah. Wiping this off for three days. In, in, when we're not traveling, it's only for one day, for 24 hours, a day and a night. But now when we travel, Allah has made it easy to where we can go from 24 day, 24 hours to 72 hours. Three days, which is three nights. Another thing is that when a person, uh, because of travel, is a person could begin salah on a riding animal. On a riding animal. A nafila, a, a sunnah prayer, and not have to worry about facing the qibla. So if, for example, I get on a camel, I can begin to pray sunnah. And if I begin to pray sunnah, I told the camel face the, the qibla. But we know how animals are, you're not going to be, especially these kind of animals, they're going to be moving to this way, to this way, this way. From the rukhsa of travel, a person can continue to pray. And this is an established sunnah from the Prophet Now we're going to go to the second thing that makes from the mashaqqah that are going to bring ease. What did we say number two was? Sickness. So again, sickness, they, it brings a lot of things. The first one that is different from what we have mentioned, it is going to be a tayammu. Right? Being sick is a reason for a person to do a tayammu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَىٰ أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ أَوْ لَا مَسْتُمُ النِّسَاء فَلَمْ تَجِدُوا مَاءً فَتَيَمَّمُوا سَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا That if a, a lot of things are, are listed, one of them is if you're sick and you can't make water, you, you cannot make wudu with water, then you can do tayyam. For example, in our case, when Allah protect us and our children, if we break a cup or we fracture a, uh, like something here and we need a cast, this is a place in wudu that needs to be washed. This is what the Sharia has come with. But because now there's this cast that is there, we will just do a tayammu on this hand while making wudu the rest of the time. Or, not even a cast. Some of us might, like a cut could come to where there's a bandage that is there to where the cast blocks everything and you can't get water in. But then you will see you have a cut here and you put this bandage that water should not touch it. Theoretically, you could go water around these areas, right, and avoid this bandage. But the Sharia has come with ease because of this injury. You could like, just do a tayammum. So that is from the first things that sickness is going to bring. The other one is we have these chairs here, and there are some people that use these chairs for salah to pray salah. This is not the original ruling of Salah. Salah did not come in the form of you need to sit down and pray. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ قَانِتِينَ Stand up, uh, you know, as those, stand up in devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This means that uh, when you're praying salah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Ibrahim the Hussain, صَلِّ قَائِمًا Pray salah while you're standing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also, also says in the يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ that when you stand up for prayer. So the original ruling is that salah is good standing. But in that hadith of Imran ibn Hussain, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ فَصَلِّ قَاعِدًا Then if you are unable to do it standing, then do it while you're sitting. Why? Because there's hardship that is preventing you from being able to stand. So pray while you're sitting down. And this was something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself did. Not only sitting down and praying himself, but also sitting down and leading the companions in Salah. And when he sat down and led the companions in Salah, what did the companions behind him do? They stand or did they sit? They stand. They were sitting. They were sitting. Now, they were sitting. The Prophet was sitting and he's leading them in Salah. This happened towards the end uh, of the Prophet's life Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The other thing, the other thing, even though this is not the Mu'atabat, the strongly held opinion in the Shafi'i Madhab, when it comes to sickness and Salah, but it is an opinion that is held by Imam Nawawi and others of the Madhab, and this is the Madhab of Imam Ahmed, um, that a person could combine prayers, could combine prayers, Dhuhr and Asr, Maghrib and Isha, because of sickness, because of sickness. If a person, his sickness is so severe that he's unable to go, wait until the next time and pray it, that he's allowed to combine them and pray. But this is not the opinion of, 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 of the Jafri Madhab. Even though the Imams of the Madhab like al Nawawi and others, um, you know, Imam al Subki and others held the opinion that this is allowed. But we just pulling there, this is not the the Mu'atamad and the Mu'atamad opinion of the school is what is the like the sound opinion on this matter in the Madhab that the person could not combine it. Another thing, if a person is sick, their responsibility of going to Salatul Jama'ah and Salatul Jum'ah and obviously Fitr fi Ramadan and breaking your fast in Ramadan, all of that is a, a sickness is a ruhsa to take away from it. So you don't have to go pray in Jama'ah, you don't have to go pray Jum'ah if you're sick, and you don't have to fast if you're sick. Now, uh, do we all agree with me, with these three? Because if we agree with these three, it means the opposite is true. It means if a person is not sick, then what we just said he could avoid because of his sickness, he cannot avoid when he's not sick. So we said Salatul Jama'ah. Salatul Jum'ah and breaking your fast in Ramadan. I know that maybe for Jum'ah and Ramadan we'll say khalatab. If a person is not sick, he needs to go. But do we say the same for Salatul Jama'ah? Going and praying Maghrib, Dhuhr, Asr, Isha, Fajr, all of these prayers, every person has to do it. And the only reason they can is because they're either traveling or because they're sick. Is this what we say? Yes. This is what we say. What, what, what is wrong with our Masajid? Every masjid you go to, it's not what we do. It's not what we do, but it is what we say, right? So when it comes to, you know, for men, the salah wajib in the masjid. There are scholars that hold that a person that doesn't pray in the masjid, there's no salah for them, right? There's no salah for them. In the Shafi'i Madhab, it is a fard kifaya on the ummah that the masajids have to have people in the praying salah. And every masjid, for the time of Fajr, for the time of Dhuhr, for the time of Asr, Maghrib, Isha, there has to be people that are praying. If there's people that are praying, then the rest of the Ummah is not responsible for going and praying. Meaning, if we are here and we're going to pray salah, then this removes the obligation from everybody else that is not here. But people have to be praying in the masjid. Right? But it is something that you know, there, there is a very strong warning for those that do not pray Salah in Jama'ah, right? 
from the most severe of them is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, if I could find somebody to lead the salah, I would go to the house of everyone that has a, to, to every house that has a man that is praying inside and burn down the house with the person inside. Right? So, like, there should be an attempt from every single one of us to say, I need to make it to the masjid to pray salah. Especially, I know that we live in this place where we have work and we have these responsibilities, especially the ones that I cannot use that excuse for. Let's say Dhuhr and Asr, I have to go to work. I can't get out of work to go to the masjid and pray and then go back. Then that means the Salah of Fajr and Maghrib and Isha, you cannot use the same excuse. Either you, you work during the night time so you can't go to Isha and Fajr. Or you work during the daytime and you can't go to Dhuhr and Asr. But there's no way a Muslim person should go his entire week Sometimes months, an entire year, saying, I don't need to go to the masjid, I'm going to go to the day of Eid, sometimes I'm going to go to the day of Eid. There should be an attempt from every single one of us to try and make it to the masjid. Tayyip? Now, what is the third reason we said? We said travel, we said sickness. What is the third reason? Ignorance. Not ignorance. Ignorance is number six. The third one is the cloth. Someone being forced. For example, if anybody forces you to do something, this qa'ida allows you to do certain things but not everything. For example, if someone says, I'm going to kill you unless you divorce your wife. Are you? <laughs> Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Laha is coming, huh? <laughs> some some, some Laha is going to go, huh? It's going to happen. So, so in that, a person is allowed to say, I divorce you. And this divorce is not going to be an actual divorce. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this is a, like a minor example. The example that we are given inside of the Quran, it is more severe than this. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِلَّا مَنْ أُكْرِهَ وَقَلْبُهُ مُطْمَئِنٌ بِالْإِيمَانِ That when a person is forced to say an act of shirk, an act of disbelief, and what do we mean when a person says an act of disbelief? This is a statement that would take somebody to the fire forever. Right? This is a statement of disbelief. A person that is forced to say that, but inside of his heart there's iman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold him accountable for because he was forced to do this thing. He was forced to say this. And because this verse is being revealed, it means that there has to be companions that have to go through this. And without a doubt, we know who they are. From them is Ammar ibn Yasir. Ammar ibn Yasir made a statement which pleased the people that were torturing him. And he goes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says, I have said, a, you know, he told him what he said. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals this verse. Talking to Ammar ibn Yasir. As long as Iman is in your heart, you being forced to do something, you are not going to be held responsible for it. And also you have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, That whatever my ummah does, because they forgot, because they, uh, like they made a mistake, and here we'll say, this is what it means, right? You made a mistake because of ignorance, or you made a mistake out of, uh, like you forgot, or you were forced to do something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has lifted from you, writing that down. That you are not going to be held responsible for it. But this, this does not include everything. It does not include everything. The things that it does not include is, for example, if somebody forces you to drink khum, alcohol, a person could drink that. He could drink alcohol. But if you go to it and you say, someone has to commit zina, or someone has to kill another person, the Sharia does not allow you to do that. Even if you force it. If you force it, let, let what's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is probably for them, but I hope I gave this the right answer. Her son is in prison. Mm -hmm. And if you know how the gang mentality in prison, and they force him to do a tattoo, mm -hmm. otherwise, they're gonna kill him more. Mm -hmm. And 
he did. So I, you know, is that the death toll under Trump or is that? So, so that that is for, it was forced into it. Yeah. So and that would be called if you were forced into it. You, you believe that you are going to be harmed in such a way where your life is at risk. And the Sharia, from the things that it came to protect what the life of a person, so therefore you're going to use this qaida to say khalas. This is an, a haram action, an action that a person should not do. That is the foundation of the Sharia. Right? In the Sharia, it's haram. But because this hardship came, the Sharia is going to be open for you to wear. You're forced to wait for your life. Yes. Right? So, so, so that is, that is, but it doesn't allow for zina and for killing. Uh, this, this does not allow for it. And the reason why is because when you look at the crimes, when you look at the crimes, someone telling you to drink khum, this is a crime that a person is going to do to themselves. I am going, like, that person is going to drink khum. For example, that person is forced to eat pork. That's to himself. When it comes to zina, and when it comes to killing, this is an action that involves somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the right of somebody else is not going to be taken. And for that, you sh it's, it's, their right should be preserved. And even if it is you either kill this person, or you are going to be killed, cause make your shahada and say, take me now. Tayyip? The other one we said is going to be a nisyan. The same hadith that we just said of Rufi'a an ummati al khata' wa nisyan wa stukhiri So anything that a person does out of forgetfulness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold them accountable. For example, yesterday we were fasting Ashura. May Allah accept it from us. I had, I made breakfast for my children. For my youngest one, I made pancakes. And he is he's going to turn two, inshallah, on the 31st of this month. So he's young. So I'm feeding him, I'm feeding him the, the pancakes. But Fridays are days in which we don't fast. And when I feed him, generally, like, he would leave something, and I'll just take it and I'll eat it. So I started, I took, like, three bites of the pancake. And my brother is with me, and he's like, I'm not fasting today. Why are you eating? <laughs> and I was like, Ya Allah, I was like, Khalas. This, I did this, I forgot. Allah, Allah. I forgot. Allah fed me, Khalas is finished. 40 minutes later, the same son, he loves blueberries. So usually after breakfast, he needs, he needs fruits. Mm -hmm. My brother gives him the blueberries, and I'm working on my computer. And the desk is high enough where he could reach and put it there. So he comes and he, he puts it there, he's watching me and he's eating the blueberries. While I'm working, I see that I grab the blueberries. And I eat with him. And I'm just eating. My brother comes and starts eating. And then he's like, after a few bites, he's like, we're fasting. <laughs> I said, yeah, Allah. I was like, today's fast is going to be easy. <laughs> We had a good breakfast, the khalas, now we have to fast. The rest of the day, no eating, guys. Uh, we have a very late shahul, huh? No, khalas, this is, this is what happened, you know? So, if something, like, in, we did it in the morning. If somebody does it before it's twelve time, and they forgot, right? Oh, I forgot I was, even if it's in the month of Ramadan, that person just con stops, continues to fast. Because they were forgetful. Right? They were forgetful in, the state that they're in. Now, do I have to, if I did it in Ramadan, do I have to make this fast up? No. Do I have to pay a kafal? No, I don't. If I purposely do it, then I have to, there's a kafal, there's a making up, but if it is done out of nisyan, and this is for any type of ibadah, that a person forgets to do something from it, they're not, there's no, you don't have to go and redo it again. The fifth one we said, it is ignorance, al-jahl. And jahl, it means in the sharia. There is a type of ignorance that a person is going to be excused for. And there's a type of ignorance that a person is not going to be excused for. The one that a person is going to be excused for, for example, 
I live in Al Badu, the, the Badia, where the Bedouins live. There is no scholar near us. And we never learned that you had to make Tahara before you prayed Salah. Or we didn't know the things that would break the Salah. And we begin to offer the prayer in a state that we are not pure. Is this an ignorance that a person is excused from? Yes or no? No? They had no, I, no <coughs> ilm of it before. They have no knowledge of it before. Oh, no knowledge? Oh, that's something else. So this is out of ignorance they did this. Oh, okay. If they live in a place where there are no scholars to teach them, they would be excused from this. Now let's move away from where the Bedouins are living and we go to the city where there's a bunch of people, a bunch of people to learn from, a bunch of scholars. A person does the same exact thing. Are they excused because of ignorance? They're not excused because of ignorance. They're not excused. The one that is excused is he actually has a reason why he's in the state of ignorance. The one that is in the city, or he's in a town where there's scholars, and the scholars are teaching these things, or he could go and ask, and he doesn't, he is going to be responsible for it on the day of judgment. That you didn't make the effort to actually go and learn it. But if there was no possible way of you actually going and learning, halas, this is, this is how, there's nothing we can, you are going to be held responsible for. Or, if the matter itself, the matter itself, this is salat and tahara, this is a basic thing. A person could be in the city, but there are cert like certain matters that they are ignorant of in the sharia. They don't know certain rulings. And if they did it out of jahl, the first few times, we'd say, okay, you didn't know. But from the moment you become aware of it, that ignorance is no longer going to be there. But when it comes, basically, the way that we should look at it, for our, our state, the things that you and I could, like, there's very few things we could be excused because we are ignorant of. What we need to focus on is, what are the things that the Sharia requires of me as a person? The Sharia requires that I pray five times a day, that I fast the month of Ramadan, that if I have wealth, that I have to be a person that pays the cat. And if I have the ability, then I have to go and perform Hajj. This is what the Sharia requires of me. In these matters, ignorance in the time that we live in, and also the place that we live in, can never be an excuse. Us not knowing how to perform Hajj, us not knowing how to pay Zakat, when in this time of so much information, not just because the world is, is, is so much more advanced, but the, we live in Silicon Valley. And we can find resources in person or online if we the time comes for us zakat. And I don't know it and I end up not paying my zakat when the year passed. And I was ignorant that I had to do it every year. And this is not going to be an ignorance that I can say is an excuse. Because you had enough opportunities to figure it out. But you chose not to. Is this point clear? Allah's. The sixth one. Just before you move to the, so they use our youth, for example, if they do mm -hmm. something out of ignorance. That, yes, it's part of their learning, but the fact that there are scholars that are around us, that, that ignorance. That ignorance in the basic things. Mm -hmm. Again, we are not telling them you have to go and become a scholar. But if somebody asks, what are the pillars of Salah? Or f forget the pillars. When I have to make wudu, what are the falail and what are the sunnah? Which actions of wudu are sunnah? Which actions are fall? If you don't know the difference, there's some ignorance that is here. And this is not ignorance that a person could be excused for living here in this time of ours. Right? But let's say they have a 401k. I don't know how to pay zakat on a 401k. Is the 401k even included in my zakat? These type of things we could say, you know what? 
It requires some, a little bit of research for you to get to it. And if you are ignorant, and let's say the past 10 years, you did not pay the zakat on it. And we didn't make any plan to pay it, or how to pay it. For that, you have the excuse. But the actual concept of, hey, when you reach this nisab, you have to pay this much zakat. And these are the things that generally make you go above it. That is not something you will be excused from. So we're clear here. Number six, it is general types of hardship. So the ones that we mentioned, all of them have to do, like they're very specific and we gave very specific answers. But my, my condition could be outside of what we, the things that we have mentioned. My mashaqqa that is going to come, it is because, for example, of a calamity. Let's say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. A person gets into a car accident. A person gets into a car accident. The car becomes total. They had insurance. We know that the wealth isn't halal or halal or insurance. What is it? For sure halal. But no doubt in wealth from insurance means halal. Now, but because of this hardship, and there's no way for you to get another car, would you be able to take that money? Yes. This is not one of the ones that we mentioned. So any type of, these type of mashaqqa allows a person to practice some type of ease. Now, not every single type of hardship is the same. Hardships are divided into three categories. There are some hardships where it will never make ibadah easy. For example, I think in today's time it's not as difficult. We go back 10-15 years. The act of performing Hajj, even now it's still difficult, but it was, it's more difficult 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. Can a person say that traveling is a hardship, but I have, I have all of the wealth that I need, I have the requirements for Hajj to become wajib on me, and I say, I can't travel. The Prophet ﷺ said that traveling it is like a, a cut from punishment. So I don't want to go to Hajj. Is a person excused from that? He's not excused. Because the action itself requires a type of sacrifice. To go to Hajj, you have to travel. With travel comes hardship. You can't use that hardship to say, I'm not going to go to Hajj. Now, if a person is actually like physically unable to go, then his mashaqqa is not the travel. His mashaqqa is the, the sickness or the condition that he is in that is making him unable to go. Or financial. Or financial. No, we're here talking about the one that's financially ready, right? No. Like we have all of the wealth to go, but then I'm like, you know, I, 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 or an easier example. You have a person, when it comes to salah, we said the asal is that it is them standing. You have two people. One of them, it actually causes them pain and harm for them to stand up and pray salah actually causes them harm. You have another one where it is easier for them to pray sitting, but if they were to do it standing, does not cause them harm. But there is like a little bit of hardship that if they sat down, this would go away. Do, do they both get the same ruling that you could sit and pray? No. It doesn't. So here we should understand all types of mashaqqa are not just the same. If the, the act like somebody says, we look at him, we see him as a, as a young, healthy person. But it's extremely difficult for him to fast in Allah. Very difficult for him to fast. And then you have someone else, very old. And he seems to us not only old, but he has some health issues. And it's extremely difficult for him to fast. Would we give these two the same ruling? No. But they have both the same complaint mm -hmm. of fasting is difficult. There's a difficulty in fasting. So not every type of difficulty means that the ibadah itself is going to become made easier. So there has to be an actual danger of some harm coming to you because of standing. There are some people 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. In old age, if they're to stand for a little bit, they have to spend the next couple of hours sitting down or laying down just for them to feel back to normal. And then there are some people, again in that old age, they're able to go and stand and work. They're able to go and stand, go around, walk wherever they want to go. But as soon as they walk into the masjid, I have to find the chair. I have to find the chair to sit down and pray out. These are two different people. Even if the difficulty or the, the, the harm that they think is going to come to them is the same. Right? So this is, is like for, uh, how we judge um, the different types of mashaqqa. That there are some that are really dangerous to where harm is going to come. For that person, khalas, the ibadah, is going to do one of a few things. Either the ibadah itself is going to be completely taken away from them. Meaning they don't have to do it. Or the ibadah is going to be made easier for them to do it. For example, a person that is unable to fast because of sickness, do they have to fast? Or is the act changed for them? Does the Sharia tell them to do something else? What do we do? Unable to fast. The Sharia takes away fasting, but you are going to feed the people for the days that you have missed. There's going to be a fidya, a kafara, for the fact that you're not fasting. So the Sharia takes it away. And then there's hardship because we are traveling and the ibadah goes from being regularly done in this manner to now it's, we've made it shorter. We've made it a little bit easier for you to be able to do it. So these are the ways that we look at um, the mashaqqa and the type of things that they have on, um, like the, the type of impact that they have on a person when it comes to ibadah. There are so many different categories that the fuqaha uh, uh, break down what they consider a mashaqqa and what it leads to. So for example, we said that in salah, that there is a total of three ruhas, three concessions when it comes to salah. The first one it is to make it shorter, al-qasr. The second one, it is to do jam in the beginning. And the third one is to do jump in later. So now we have three types of takhfif, three types of ease that is being brought to you. We could also say that there is the takhfif of badr, that you can't do one action, so in place of it you have to do another action. In place of it you have to do another action. For example, you can't make wudu because you're sick or because you can't find water. What do you do instead? So this is an act being changed for another act, right? Because this is a hardship now, خلاص, let's change it to one that is easier. Now, there are other types of smaller qa'idas that fall into under these. For example, one of the, the most famous ones is one that says that hardship, hardship, they make halal what is haram. Even though we could just say, we, like, we don't need to break it down this way, but we could just go break it, just let it be. There's a hardship, ease should be there. But here, you are looking at things that are mahdur, things that are haram, right? And there's a darura, there's a need, and now it makes this thing that is haram permissible. This applies when it comes to things like eating, drinking. And in some cases, as the fuqaha of our time use it, housing, and so on. Now the question comes. We did a talk on the types of animals, that, on the types of meat that we are unable to eat. The number one that we mentioned was al meat Dead animal. An animal that is dead, haram for you to eat. But let's say that you are on the brink of death from hunger. And you see a dead animal. Can you take this animal and eat it? The asal is is haram, but you can take it and eat it. Now the question comes: How much of it can you eat? Huh? Just to keep the back straight. So it's haram for you to actually eat it until you become full and say, "I can't take another bite." It's haram for you. 
what it allows is just enough for you to say, I am not, I'm not going to die. For example, drinking khamr, because there's nothing else to drink. And you fear dying because of thirst. A person in that state, he drinks the khamr, not until he, he can't drink anymore, his stomach is making noise from how much he's drunk, just enough, just enough to say, khas, I have satisfied my thing. Now with this we go to the idea, even though, even though, I don't agree with, with the opinion that a person is in need of a house and he could go and get a loan that has a riba or, or whatever. If we go to that, if we go to that, can I say, let's say I invested into a company, uh, made some good money from it, but the house that I want, the house that I want is seven million dollars. The house that I need is 700k. Which one am I allowed to buy and which one am I not allowed to buy? I have to buy the 700k one, to buy that one, because it fulfills the needs that I have of getting the house. Now to go beyond that, now becomes actually halal, for two reasons. We're doing an, a haram action, right? And then on top of that, we are going against this qaida that we are using to say it was halal in the first place. To say that it is not halal, to say that it is allowed in the first place. Please. I see some drivers like, where they, they buy cars, finance, but have no choice. Mm -hmm. Try to walk somewhere like outside in cash or whatever, but he couldn't find job to walk, mm -hmm. and he has kids. Mm -hmm. So he's he bought car, mm -hmm. finance, and there's interest to pay. Mm -hmm. So and this can be wrong or it's fine. So did everyone hear the question? Wait, is this but is the question? Not me. Yeah, yeah, not you. But this this, this is the question here. Is car financing halal? Yes. Huh? We, we, we talked about this during the first session. What? So he said it depends on the? It depends on the finance. Let's take a step back. Is every interest riba? No. Every interest? Is it riba? No. Okay, next question. Is every riba interest? Oh my God. Yes. yes. Every riba is interest. But not every interest is riba. Are you? Let's, let's expand here to this car financial, car financial idea. If you go to a place like Honda, or you go to Toyota, or these car companies that have what they call in-house financing, and they tell you, you go to them, I want you a Toyota account. And he's like, you know what? I don't have the 30,000 or 36,000, whatever, to pay it now. I want to pay it over the span of five years. He tells you, I will give this car to you for five years. The APR, the annual like, percentage that you're going to pay for it, is going to be 5%. And the total of the price of the car is 42,000 if you buy it. If you give him cash, it's going to be 36. But if you pay it monthly, it's going to be 42,000. Can I take that car? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Why can I take it? Because even though he's calling it interest, it is not liver. Because two things are happening. One, he actually has to own the car. And this is what, when they, in-house financing, this is what it approves. In-house financing means this is our car. So like for example, Honda, they have Honda Financial. This is our car that we are selling to you. And because we are selling it to you, I can determine the price. I can express the price however way I want it. I can call it interest. But in the Sharia, that is not considered interest. Right? So because of that, if they have in-house financing and you take their car, خلاص, alhamdulillah, you have this car, you pay monthly, you don't have to worry about the interest as being as being part of uh, like river. Now, the other side, the same dealerships, if you go and you ask for a used car, they'll offer you financing. But they don't do in-house financing. They do it through a third party, through a bank. They give you the same papers. It says interest on it. 
It tells you the same APR. Can you take that one? You cannot take that one. Because now in that, in that scenario, this is not a car that they own, and the person that is giving you the loan is a bank. And they're charging you because of that loan that they have given you. So their money is making more money. And this now becomes an interest that is riba. Right? Where I, I give you this phone for $20, but if you don't give this, if you don't want to buy, you accept $20. You come back and you say, you know what, I don't have $20, and I pay you in two months. I say, you know what, pay me $22. $11 now, $11 later. We had an agreement, now I've increased the price after I've given it to you, or even before I give it to you, and I'm like, my money that I was giving you is going and making more money. That is what's riba when it comes to financing and things like that. But if they do in-house financing, then it wouldn't be considered riba. So all you have to do is go and determine if this is a company that has in-house financing. Majority of the bigger ones, they do. The smaller ones, they don't. But there are some that you can convince from the smaller side to tell you, you know what, we can offer can offer what's called in-house financing. I, I, an example of this is like Tesla. Tesla, their number, the, the opinion that comes with it is right away we're giving this to the bank. Third party financing is halal. But if you ask them, do you do in-house financing? The standard to get the car goes up. So what do you have to put down? What do you have to have in terms of uh, your credit score and your salary and things are going to be different if we, we are the ones that are giving you in-house financing. So if these two, same company, they can sell a car to a person, and the agreement could be the same as one person, but because of who's actually selling it, who's providing this finance, one person is engaging in riba, while the other person is engaging in not riba. And he has interest, and not every interest is halal, but every riba is halal. So is, is it like a default state of all in-house financing? In financing all, every in-house financing, yes. The other condition too is that it, you have to agree to a price, right, before you leave when you buy it. And when they do in-house financing, even when they do the other financing, the price you already told, that you are going to pay this much in five years, right? If that is there and it is in-house financing, cost, I, I can get the car and pay the APR that they provide. But back to the other question, if there is secured party finance, Mm -hmm. and you have no choice, and that's your main work, the main of provision with you, so that fall you under, under some category? I, I would say no. Mm -hmm. And the reason we say no is because there is this, I, like, there, there is in-house financing now at all of the major car companies. Right? All of the big car companies, they already offer it. So it wouldn't make sense for you to go do something halal while you can go and do something that is halal. Right? Like this option is there. So then you can't say hardship put me in this position. Because you are going to pay the same amount of money. You are going to sign the same contract, but the difference comes to the bank is the third party that is giving you this money. And their riba is not the same as that of the car company. The car company has interest, the bank is using riba. Are we clear here? We will see each other, inshallah, next week. And we are going to finish the two qa'idahs that are left. Uh, you can't have a specific part for that part in the future, inshallah. A specific part about financing? Yeah. We will have something on, on, on Islamic financing. Soon be the With that, we say Allah wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.